Welcome to LG Ministry. We're glad you have chosen to watch our program. My name is Coogan Collins, and I'm the minister at the Long Grove Church of Christ. Our hope and desire is that you will open up your Bible and study along with us. Be sure to check out all of our lessons on YouTube. Now let's get to our lesson. Our lesson today will come from Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 2. So let's begin with our text. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the shame, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When I read these two verses, what I immediately get from them is the idea of endurance. The writer has given these first century Christians and Christians today two different ways for us to have the inspiration to run the Christian race with endurance. First, he uses the faithful men and women he just talked about in Hebrews chapter 11. And then he gives the ultimate example, which should motivate us all, which is Jesus. Let's begin by breaking our text down. The first part of our verse says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. I remember back when I was young and just starting to really dig into the Bible, that whenever I read this verse, I thought it was saying that all those faithful men and women of chapter 11 were watching us and perhaps cheering us on. But that's not what our text means at all. The word therefore definitely points back to those faithful followers of God in chapter 11. But these men and women are not watching us, rather they are a cloud of witnesses and that the actions of their past lives are a witness to what faithful followers of God look like. Their example teaches us what it means to endure. I think it's important that we take a quick look at these great witnesses of faith as they will encourage us to be faithful to God. You'll have to read chapter 11 on your own and begin to look and do a separate study of all those people that are, missing, uh, that are listed there because I'm not going to have time to go through all of them in great detail, but I will certainly mention them. Hebrews 11, verse number 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead, still speaks. Our first example is about the faith of Abel. We don't have as much information as we would like to know about Cain's and Abel's offering, but we can imply from this text that Abel offered his sacrifice with faith, but Cain didn't. Even though Cain ended his brother's life, we learn that Abel's faith is still serving as a witness to us today through the Word of God. When we think about Abel, we need to think about what kind of legacy we're going to leave behind. Are we going to have people look back at our lives and be inspired and encouraged by our faith? Or will people look down on us and the behavior that we had because we're kind of like Cain? When we realize that our faith can live on long after we're dead, this should cause us to want to endure and be great examples for our God. In verse 5, we learn about the faithful Enoch, who was the father of Methuselah, the longest living man recorded in the Bible. We know that he was a prophet, Jude 1, verse 14, and he walked with God, Genesis 5, verse 24. He and Elijah are the only recorded men who didn't have to taste death before they were taken by God. We can learn from Enoch, Enoch that um, if we ever hope to see heaven, we too must walk with God by keeping His commands. I don't think it, be, it could be said any better than we read in verse 6. It's 
says, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Next, we have Noah and Abraham in verse 7 and following. Now, I'm putting these two together because both showed great faith in doing things they had never done before, but they listened to God. Noah had to build this huge ark that no one had ever built just because God told him to. Abraham had to leave his home and go to a place he had never been before. Though that would be risky for someone to do during this time, he trusted in God and he did it. He even trusted God when he told him to go sacrifice his son. These two men teach us that we are not always going to know what is going to happen in our future. But we must learn to trust in God and just push forward and then watch as God does his work for us or through us. These men teach us to get out of our comfort zone and try new things for the Lord because if we just keep doing the same old things, we're not going to grow as we should. We shouldn't play it safe like the wicked servant who buried his master's money instead of doing something with it because we know things didn't work out well for him and he was cast out where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. Though the majority are men in chapter 11, we also see that Sarah is mentioned. Now we might be quick to point out how she laughed when she heard she was still going to give birth to a son in her old age, but we can know from verse 11 that she too was a woman of faith. Sometimes we might find ourselves laughing at the thought of something happening that seems impossible, but you never know what great things might happen in your life if you put your trust in God. Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph are mentioned, but then we come to the parents of Moses who kept their child hidden instead of following the decree of the Pharaoh to kill the firstborn in verse 23. This teaches us as parents that we should not embrace any law of the land that contradicts the word of God. They were not afraid of the king's order and we should never follow the law of our land that allows our young people to murder their unborn children. Imagine how different things would have been if Moses had been killed. I realize that God could have raised someone else up to take Moses' place, but it wouldn't have been the same. We know that Moses became one of the great leaders of God's people. Now, it took a burning bush and some strong encouragement from God, but he did what needed to be done. By his faith, he stood up against the mighty Pharaoh, and by his faith, and the power of God, he parted the Red Sea so his people could cross onto the other side. God used Moses when he was 80 years old. So this tells us that no matter how old we are, God can use us to accomplish great things in his kingdom. But we have to be willing to set our excuses to the side and to rise up and do the work that God wants us to do. I absolutely love the story of Jericho. That was a fortified city that no one could touch, but Joshua and his people put their trust in God and followed his instructions of marching around the city for seven days. And on the seventh day, they had no doubt when they blew their horns and the walls came tumbling down. And then they still had to go inside and they had to fight these people and take them over. You know what? We're all going to have to face what might seem like impenetrable walls in our lives. But if we learn from Joshua, we can know there are no walls in our lives that cannot be knocked down when we put our trust in God and follow his will. Rahab was a harlot, but she believed in God and changed her ways as she protected the men that originally spied out Jericho. And God protected her and those with her in her household, which tells us that we can start out as being opposed to God, but we can all change our ways before it's too late. If Rahab had not changed her way, she would have been dead. But thanks to her faith, she finds herself in this great list of faithful followers of God. I want you to notice who the rest are that are mentioned within this chapter and how they endured as faithful servants of God. Let's begin reading in verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith of new kingdoms worked righteousness, obtained promises, 
stop the mouth of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might attain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. These faithful men and women understood that having faith in God can be hard, and it can cost you your life. They understood that it was far greater to serve God and die remaining true to Him than to cower down or to blend in with the worldly. Of course, this chapter could have been much longer because there are so many faithful men and women that serve as good examples to us that should motivate us to move forward and never quit. Many times people will convince themselves that their problems are worse than everyone else's. And they'll think that nobody else could have possibly experienced what they've experienced. But I can guarantee you, if even if you just use the people mentioned in chapter 11, I don't think you could find your situation being any worse than theirs. And if you add in men like Job, then your problems are not going to stand a chance in comparison. Even if we didn't have all these faithful men and women to read about, we could certainly know that others in the church have had the same struggles we have, which is why Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. As great as the examples are that we have in our lives and from these faithful men and women that can be used to inspire us to never quit, our next example is what everyone can look toward as we read in verse 39. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Of course, I'm talking about Jesus. Again, our verse says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The old devil wants us to think that the weight of our sin is too great. But it's not, because we can lay it to the side and be free from it. We have no reason to allow sin to ensnare us and to keep us down. Instead, we must learn to run with endurance, looking to Jesus as our inspiration because he is the author and finisher of our faith. Though we don't know who the writer of Hebrews is, one similarity the writer has with Paul is the idea of running a race. Notice what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight. Not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. I think we all understand the basic concept of training when you're running. You can't just, you know, put your bag of chips and candy bar to the side and jump up off the couch and start running. No, you have to run almost every day and keep pushing yourself a little further to build up your endurance. Those who get serious about running will add on weights to their legs or put on a weight vest, and some will even train in higher elevations where the oxygen level is low. But when they get ready to race against other people, as the Hebrew writer pointed out, they will lay aside those weights and they will run at a lower elevation. All of this is done to make them the most fit they can be. Imagine how much faster and easier it would be to run without the hindrance of those leg weights. 
Imagine how much easier it will be to breathe at a normal elevation. There will be no stopping that runner. In a similar way, we at times allow the sin of this world to weigh us down, and this can make it more difficult for us to stay focused. But when we can get to the point where we can lay that sin to the side, then we can run as we have never run before. We have the perfect example to look at, which is Jesus, because He has shown us how it is done. In fact, all we really need to do is to have Jesus as our master example, because He went through it all for us. He never allowed the way to sin to be a part of his life, and he ran his race perfectly all the way to the cross. Again, notice the last part of our text again. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Though Jesus went through so much for us, it brought him joy to make the Father's plan play out, which brought us salvation. I want you to really think about what Jesus was willing to do for us. 2 Corinthians 8, verse number 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus allowed himself to become flesh. You will notice that he doesn't start being called the Son of God until he was born of Mary. Could you imagine leaving that wonderful place of heaven knowing that you're going to have to face living a life here on earth with man and all that you're going to have to go through? Because Jesus knew exactly what he was going to have to endure as he carried out the Father's plan. Now, we don't have time to look at Jesus' childhood and how his parents were having to move around a lot to keep him from being killed. In fact, there are a lot of things that Jesus had to endure during his ministry that I don't have time to talk about. But one thing that I do want to spend a little bit of time on is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. I'm sure you're familiar with how Jesus goes to John the Baptist and is baptized, and we have that wonderful moment when we see all three members of the Godhead because Jesus is in the flesh, the Father speaks out from heaven, and the Holy Spirit is descending on Jesus. Of course, one of the first things that Jesus does is to go out into the wilderness as we read in Matthew 4, verse number 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. If you know the rest of the story, you know that the devil does his best to tempt Jesus to sin with his best three temptations. Though the devil uses scripture and tries to convince Jesus to sin, Jesus uses scripture to answer the devil to show how the devil was twisting the scriptures. Since it is such a short read. Let's just go ahead and read it. Matthew 4, verse 3. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Though Jesus was officially beginning his ministry, he starts out with one of the biggest challenges anyone could start out with. He does a 40-day fast from food, which would make anyone extremely weak, both physically and mentally. And then he takes on the devil at his best. Let's not forget that Jesus had been preparing for this moment his whole life. And, of course, we know he defeated the devil. What this teaches us is that even if we are at our weakest moment, we can know that even though the, the solution the world is offering might seem like a great thing, we know that if Jesus was able to resist the devil directly when he was at his strongest, we can certainly resist the devil and his worldly temptations today. We can endure and fight against the temptation of sin just as Jesus did. First, we must prepare to resist sin by being students of God's Word. 
Second, we, whenever we're faced with a temptation, we need to use God's word to combat it. In other words, we need to put into action what we have been studying by following the will of God instead of the world. One last thing this event tells us is that as soon as you start trying to work for the kingdom, the devil will be there trying to discourage you so that you don't succeed. But with Jesus on our side, we don't have to listen to the devil, and we can send him packing just like Jesus did. One thing we need to realize is that we are going to have to fight many battles in our Christian lives. Just because you beat the old devil in one battle doesn't mean you've won the war. The same is true with Jesus because notice what Luke's account says after the devil tries his best to take Jesus down. Luke 4 verse 13. And when the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Jesus came to this earth for the purpose of living a sin-free life so he could become the perfect sacrifice for man and his sin. So let's jump ahead toward the end of Jesus' life at the garden prior to Jesus being arrested. Luke 22, verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus was in control of when he would die. There have been many attempts on his life before, but he always escaped death because it was not his time. But now it was. He knew what he would have to endure in order to make salvation possible for us. And we can see the human side of Jesus as he prays to the Father, asking if it's possible for this burden to be taken away. However, Jesus humbly submitted himself to the will of the Father. The other accounts show him praying the same prayer three times. We should learn a lot from Jesus' attitude. First, it's always a good thing to go to God in prayer. So don't ever forget to pray because God is listening and wants to hear from you. Second, we must realize that bad things are going to happen in life despite how much we pray that they don't. Like Jesus, we must humbly submit ourselves to the will of God, knowing that he will make the best of our situations. For example, Jesus' death on the cross seems pointless from a human perspective, but God knew that it was the only way for forgiveness of sins to be had for all mankind. So as tragic as Jesus' death was, much good came from it much more than we deserve. We can also see from our text that Jesus was under great stress from it all because his sweat became like great drops of blood. There is certainly a medical condition where this can happen. People's blood vessels, they get under so much stress that they can explode or burst open and they begin to sweat out uh, blood because of the great stress they're under. So no one, and I mean absolutely no one, can ever say that what Jesus did for was easy for him to do. He felt every bit of it. Next, Jesus is arrested and is given an illegal trial by the Jews. Along the way, he is beaten and mocked, and he is drugged before Pilate, then he's sent to King Herod, and then back to Pilate again. Pilate couldn't find anything worthy to put Jesus to death, but the people were adamant about it. He even gave them a choice between a known murderer and a robber, and Jesus, thinking that Maybe, just maybe, they would release Jesus. That's not what happened as we read in Matthew 27, verse 21. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail it, at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. You can say that word scourge without giving it much thought, 
But scourging is one of the most brutal punishments that has ever been invented by man. Mr. Hester writes, the scourge was a whip with several throngs, each loaded with an acorn-shaped ball of lead, with sharp pieces of bone or spikes, stripped of his clothes, his hands tied by a lictor, who plied these instruments of torture with severity almost to the point of death of the prisoner. Each stroke cut into the quivering flesh until the veins and sometimes the entrails were laid bare. Often the scourge struck the face and knocked out the eyes and teeth. Scourging almost always ended in fainting and sometimes even in death. Mr. Lipscomb writes, The scourge was made of rods or throngs with pieces of bone or lead fastened to one end. The condemned person received the blows while fastened to a post so as to have the back bent and the skin stretched. With the blows, the back became raw and the blood spurted out. The punishment was so cruel that the condemned person very often succumbed to it immediately. You know, it wasn't uncommon for people to die from being scourged, which explains why Jesus could not carry his own cross. Thinking about Jesus having to endure such a brutal beating makes me cringe and it breaks my heart, especially knowing that he was innocent and he endured it all for us. Not only did Jesus have to endure this physical pain, he also had to continue to see the people who he came to save mock him and express hatred toward him. Of course, he also had to endure being nailed to the cross between two thieves, where he would have to fight for every breath he took while being in extreme pain. Well, I could go into much more detail. Hopefully you can see that Jesus' death on the cross for us was certainly not easy for him but he did it for us anyway. His blood purchased the church, Acts 20, verse 28. He has made salvation possible for us all. This is why we should love him enough to pick up the cross daily and follow after him. It's why you and I should never quit. One more time, I want to read our original text, but this time I want to include verse 3. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. If we want to make sure that we never quit fighting the good fight of faith, we can be encouraged by the examples of these faithful men and women in the Bible or by our brothers and sisters in Christ. But all we really need to do is to look to Jesus, who is the greatest example of endurance. I hope we all will continue to run the race of Christianity and cross the finish line of glory. But in order for any of this to matter, you must begin the race. If you are not a Christian, then why not begin your race? You know, if we want to receive the forgiveness of our sins that Jesus brought to us, then we must obey the gospel call. Paul wrote in Romans 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. In order to obey the gospel, we must do the following. We must hear the word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We must believe in Jesus, John 8, 24. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. We must repent, Luke 13, 3. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. We must confess Jesus as our Lord, Romans 10 and verse number 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And yes, we must be baptized, 1 Peter 3, verse 21. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what we must do in order to accept the saving grace of God. Obeying these things in no way earns your salvation, but it is how you accept it. I do think it's important for us to realize that God's word gets even more specific 
and shows us exactly when a person's sins are forgiven. Acts 2 verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, notice for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's at the point of water baptism when your sins are forgiven. Therefore, you cannot be saved by simply accepting Jesus into your heart or saying a sinner's prayer, which cannot be found in the Bible anyways. So I hope you will think on these things. And if you are ready to obey the gospel, I hope you will go to one of your local Church of Christ and, and you'll talk to them and study the matter out and, and sit down and, and really think about the commitment it takes to become a child of God. It'll be the greatest decision that you ever made in your life. Hope you found this lesson helpful. No matter what lesson I preach, I want you to test what I say or any person says about God's Word by comparing what is being said to the Bible. Don't ever be lazy in this area because it is too important to simply trust in what a man is saying because we are all human and we're capable of being wrong. One thing we know for sure is that God's Word will not lead us astray, so we can always trust in it. As Psalm 146.3 says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. Psalm 18, verse 30, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. I will always do my best to preach the truth, but I hope if you catch me teaching error that you will contact me so that we can discuss the matter. If you would like to learn more about LG Ministry and the congregation I preach at, feel free to visit our website at lgchurchofchrist.com. On our website, you will find a lot of material that can help you with your spiritual growth. On our main page, you will find an online correspondence course that you can take that will walk you through the basics. On our sermon page, you will find just about every sermon I've preached at my local congregation. You will also find some audio sermons and Bible class materials that you are free to study and use. On our article page, you will find tracts that you can read and print off and articles that have been written for our local paper. Finally, on our video page, you'll find our new video lessons like the one that you're watching now. I know we live in a fast-paced world where it seems like we don't have time to do much of anything. But I want to encourage you to find time out of each day to sit down and to study God's Word. Life is great and there's nothing wrong with being busy. But we must be careful that we don't get to the point where we get so busy that we fail to take time to feed ourselves spiritually from God's Word. We must remember that God is supposed to be our number one priority. If you find my lessons to be helpful, be sure and tell people about our program so that others can hear sound lessons from the Bible. I hope you have a blessed day.